The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Do you know what a word cloud is? word cloud. It's something that your computer can generate. You um, take a bit of text. It could be lines from a movie. It could be a speech. It could be a ri- any kind of writing. And you feed it in, just like this example. And then the word cloud generator puts all the words on the screen, but only once. It removes all the little words like the and a and an. But every time a word gets repeated, instead of putting the word up there again, it just makes it larger. So if you look at this famous speech that got put in a word cloud, obviously the word that was said the most was nation. Nation dedicated, people dead, great, shall. Any, any guess what speech that might be? Very good, Gettysburg Address. Very good, yeah. Four score and seven years because it's not even in there but you got the sense of what the speech meant when you see those key words. We have a second one to look at. I'm going to be running the guys in the balcony all day today. Oh, how about this speech? The big words, I, my will. That is the speech of the rich fool in today's parable. If you put all of his lines in together, that's his message. Wow. Wow. When you know that and look at the story, everything begins to make a little more sense. It's all about him. I, me, mine. Did you hear how the story began? It began with, this is one of the stories that begins with good news and ends with bad news. It begins with great news. The land of a rich man yields abundantly. I mean, this guy's got everything, and now he's got even more. He has an unbelievable harvest going on. He should be rejoicing, and instead, he is worrying. He is anxious. Oh, my gosh. What am I going to do with all this? Well, you may say, why don't you sell it? Yeah, but you see, if you sell it, 
the rate on grain is really going down this year because it's such a bumper crop going on, not just his farm, all the other farms. So you really you need, you need to store it. You can store it up to seven years. You want to store it so you can make more money off it during the lean years ahead. But he's got a problem because the barn he has, oh my gosh, he'll, he'll fill it up to the brim and he'll have grain left over. What does he do? What does he do? What, I need bigger barns, he thinks. But you can't do that because if you go for bigger barns and you're going to give up some land for next year's crop and you won't have as much grain. So what if you tore the barn down and built up? You know, go that direction. And so he, he's, he's focused on what can he do and what can he do? In my barns, my grain, my harvest. And his whole goal is for the sake of my soul. And at the end of the story, we hear the grim reminder that his soul doesn't belong to him, but to God. And neither does the grain, the harvest, or the barns, because he only got to borrow them for his lifetime, and now they get passed on to someone else. It is good that today we paired Ecclesiastes with this gospel lesson. Because as someone once said in this gospel lesson, this simple observation, you will never see a U-Haul hitched to a hearse. <laughs> never. That's the wisdom of Ecclesiastes, which we waited for with bated breath this morning. Such a great lesson, such a great lesson, and we are ready to hear it, and Chuck did a great job with it. The lesson of Ecclesiastes, and if you've never read it all the way through, this, this ancient wisdom that barely made it into the Old Testament, oh my gosh, for 21st century Americans, it is for us. It's a great one. Read all 12 chapters, sit down, let this soak in. You might find it depressing, because it proclaims four big truths. Number one, everything is just on loan because we are only passing through. Got it? But we want to forget that one all the time. But that's the reality. We just borrow things for a while, and then we pass them on. That's lesson one. And lesson two was that word vanity. Vanity's in there a lot. I really don't like that word. Vanity makes me think of somebody stopping to check in the mirror and you know, preen and make sure everything's okay. But with the, the word here is a good Hebrew word called hevel. 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 Everything's hevel. And what hevel is, is smoke. So you, 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 it looks real, but when you try to grasp it, it slips through your fingers. It's, it's, it's smoke and mirrors. It's, it, it's, a, it's illusion. It's not permanent. And the message of Ecclesiastes is, Every time you try to amass things, whether they be possessions, whether it be wisdom, whether it be pleasure, you can see it, you can enjoy it, but it's not permanent. It's smoke, and it's gone. Third lesson of Ecclesiastes, and here's where the wisdom kicks in. Best thing for us to do, eat, drink, and not be merry, eat, drink, and find joy in our work. Find joy in our work. That, that's a deep concept. At the beginning of Genesis, when human beings were created, we found joy in our work. We were glad to be caretakers of this earth. But after the fall, work became a curse and a burden. To find joy in our work is to reconnect with what God created us to be, to be redeemed. So the message of Ecclesiastes, enjoy the food God has given you, celebrate, drink with one another, and find joy in your work. And then a fourth thing, fear God, remember your creator. Don't lose sight of God in all this. It's a very, very simple message. 
But you can see from the parable that Jesus told, Jesus got the message of this book. And he could package it into a beautiful little story about a rich fool to try to teach us how to live. Ecclesiastes also writes a lot about heaping, about amassing stuff, and that that work of amassing, of, of heaping, of building is really a curse. It's not a blessing. It's not a blessing at all. I'll give you an example. I was driving along the highway, and a hot little sports car just right by me. I mean, fast. It was beautiful. I saw it had a bumper sticker. I saw the license plate, MD was on it. I thought, oh, doing well, doing well. Catch up with him at a stoplight, and I read the bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins. I said, I never want that guy touching me. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> I know what he's about. He's about amassing. He's about piling, about the toys, not about the mission. Yeah, we amass. Yeah, a couple years, if you remember, right before, um, right before COVID shut everything down, about two months before that, Marie Kondo caught on fire. If you've not read this Japanese writer, she's done a video series. She's the expert on decluttering your life. It's wonderful, wonderful stuff to read. That happened, and then everybody dumped all their junk on Goodwill and Salvation <laughs> Army right as the pandemic began. I don't know if you remember that. But in her book, where she talks about all the ways to deal with the piles we've amassed and to declutter our life and be free and find joy, that's really the message, find joy. In the middle of all that, she makes a comment about us, about Americans. And from her Japanese perspective, she says, Americans are the hardest to work with because their solution when they amass stuff is buy another storage unit. Right? Just like the fool. More storage. Her challenge is pull everything out of the storage you have, sort it, and put back what you truly need. Not to think you can solve the problem with just more storage. We amass so many things. And Jesus, when you look at the life and teachings of Jesus, is about giving away so many things. In the stories and teachings of Jesus, it's never about amassing things that are fleeting. It's about building up riches in heaven. It's about the eternal. It's about the things that matter, loving and learning. That's what matter. Jesus says that's where your focus should be. And while many people heap and pile so many things, whether it be riches, for some it's grudges, Jesus instead says give that away and forgive, and let go, and quit amassing. And when a large crowd was still hanging around at dinner time, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and gave them away. He models a different kind of freedom. The rich fool had as his goal to eat, drink, and be merry. He was a fool because he could do that that very day. He didn't need bigger barns to do it. Jesus teaches us to pray, give us today our daily bread. Another way to say that is, give us today our bread for tomorrow. Help us to live one day at a, at a time, Lord, trusting that what we need for tomorrow will be provided today. And we trust that. That's a different mindset than thinking the future needs to be built up for again and again. I've gotten to see a lot of different congregations over the years. So this is the interim pastor reflection moment. <laughs> Churches love to stockpile things. Sometimes it's money, and it's not even designated in why it's being saved. It's just being saved and nothing's happening with it. And you can tell. You can tell without looking at the balance sheet what's going on in a parish like that. And if you really want to know, without even looking at the balance sheet, the place to really go look 
is the church kitchen. Look in the refrigerators. I'm not kidding. Usually they're filled. And they're filled with things like two liter bottle of pop that only has this much left in the bottom because it was served at youth group and you thought, well, we can't throw that little bit away. Someone will drink it sometime during the week. We better save it just in case somebody needs it. There's also that pitcher of, of cream that was for the coffee hour that people didn't want to pour out afterwards because it might be used in a future coffee hour that nobody knew about and now it's butter. Yeah, I mean, you get the idea. It's just, you can tell by when you walk into the kitchen. It's just this this, this amassing, this piling. Wow. It was a little thing. But we have no leftover cookies in our fridge at Grace. Fellowship was over. Some cookies were left. Surely someone would eat them one day. But why wait for one day? Instead, hospitality sent them over to the jail, to the inmates, and to the officers. While the cookies were still fresh and good. St. Augustine said the problem with the rich fool was he'd forgotten this. The safest place to store your excess grain is in the bellies of the poor. The best place to store your excess chocolate chip cookies are in the bellies of the incarcerated. That's the way Jesus empowers us to think. It's not scarcity. It's abundance. It's not fear. It's loving and giving. One day at a time. So, one last word cloud to look at. If you take the words of probably one of our favorite hymns, Amazing Grace, what jumps out isn't amazing. <laughs> Grace now will. That's the love of God. It's for today. It'll get us through till tomorrow. Thanks be to God.